Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. We all know that Jesus isn't afraid to have a good time. We saw that at the wedding, of Ca- wedding at Cana. He's always looking for an excuse to throw a party. So it's no surprise then that we find Jesus today in Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. Now granted, this is a little odd because we're celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, which was originally a Jewish festival, but more on that later. But both Pentecost and the Feast of Booths were two of three pilgrimage festivals that brought countless Jews to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. And that third feast, everyone at Bible, everyone who's at Bible study knows, that third feast was Passover. But the Feast of Booths was sort of seen as the feast, is better than the other two. More people showed up for it than any other pilgrim festival in Jerusalem. And this was, I think, because it was a lot more fun than the other two. Passover recalled the angel of death passing over Israel as they were about to be freed from Egypt. And Pentecost celebrated the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Now, you might recall, those were two rather solemn and fearful events in Israel's history. But the Feast of Booths, on the other hand, was a feast of abundance and joy and praise to God, who gives prosperity and life. It was a harvest festival, a big thanksgiving, thanking God for providing for Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness. And it also looked forward to the final harvest, when God's people would be gathered into the eternal promised land. And that's something worth celebrating, don't you think? So for seven days, the Jews camped out, living and eating and drinking in tents like the Israelites did in the desert. Plus, there were parades, water fights, and fireworks. It was a blast. Definitely the funnest of all the festivals all to celebrate God's presence with Israel in the wilderness and for providing for them and for bringing them into the promised land. Now, after all of the celebration, on the eighth day, there was a holy convocation in the temple where scripture was read and prayers were offered. And this is where we find Jesus today. On this, the great day of the feast, the flimsy tents gave way to the solid stones of the temple, marking God's permanent presence in Jerusalem. And in a special service, the the faithful Jews anticipated the day when all the exiles who were scattered throughout the world would be gathered into the new Jerusalem, and living waters would flow out of the city. There would be a river of life gushing forth from the threshold of the temple, like Ezekiel had prophesied. And there was this big, elaborate water ceremony that accompanied the service, too, to to portray this. So knowing all of that, you can see why some people might be a little troubled when Jesus decides to stand up in the middle of the church service and cry out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You see, all the Jews expected the temple to be the place of God's eternal presence, where, they would, where their thirst would be satisfied, where they would party with him into eternity. But instead, Jesus claims himself to be the source of living waters, the life of the party in the new temple where God is truly present. The temple doesn't matter anymore, he says. The place to be is with me. And there's even a promise if you stick with Jesus. He says, whoever believes in me will have rivers of living water flowing out of his own heart. The believer will become part of that new temple, the house of living stones, from from which the river of life will flow. So you don't just get to attend the eternal feast. You get to drink in that holy water. And really not only drink it, but be overwhelmed by it, drowned in the life-giving water that flows from the body of Christ. It sounds a little bit like holy baptism, doesn't it? 
But just like in baptism, Jesus won't let you have the water without the Spirit, and there can't be the Holy Spirit without water. Think back to creation for a second. Where do you find the Holy Spirit? Hovering over the waters. You can't separate the Holy Spirit from water. And John makes clear this connection between Jesus, water, and spirit when he says, this, Jesus said, this prophecy, or this promise of living waters, this Jesus said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him would receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given. This finally brings us around to the feast that we're celebrating today, Pentecost. The Jews observed Pentecost 50 days after Passover. And this was also a harvest festival originally, but it came to mark more significantly the revelation of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And like the Feast of Booths, Jesus transformed the Feast of Pentecost into a party in his presence. Instead of Moses, you have Christ. Instead of giving a new law, God gives his Holy Spirit. And instead of fire and lightning and thunder on Mount Sinai, you get the flame of faith on the believer's head and the thunderous joy of hearts proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Now you might think, hold on, Pastor, Jesus wasn't at Pentecost. That's the whole point of Pentecost. But he was there. We touched on this a couple weeks ago. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? He's not just a comforter in times of distress. The Holy Spirit's main job is to keep us with Jesus in the one true faith. In other words, he's constantly bringing Christ into the church's presence. Even more, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, and enlightens us so that we become the body of Christ. And we join that body by the waters of holy baptism. So Christ is most certainly present at Pentecost because the Holy Spirit makes Christ present wherever his word is proclaimed. And this, again, is another reason to celebrate. Christ is the life of the party. So, when, so wherever he is, it's a time of joy and celebration. The party of all parties. And that's actually what people are thinking is happening at Pentecost. They see all of these people ecstatically proclaiming the good news of Christ. They're amazed and perplexed. And what do they think? These guys must be drunk. They're filled with new wine. But that's the kind of bliss and excitement that Christ gives us in his Holy Spirit. Because by his Holy Spirit, we know that he comes down to us to give us his life forgiveness, and salvation. But the thing is, you can't count the 50 days of Pentecost, the 50 days to Pentecost, without starting at Passover. None of this Holy Spirit action is possible without Christ's transformation of that third great festival. And John hides this little revelation in the Gospel lesson, too. He says, The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now we might hear that and think that for Christ to be glorified, he has to be risen and ascended to heaven. But in John's gospel, he's clear that Christ's glory isn't being seated at the right hand of the Father. The glory of Christ is his crucifixion, which takes place in Jerusalem on Passover in 33 A.D., And so his death transformed the feast of Passover into a feast of victory for us. The unblemished lamb was killed for our sake. His blood now marks the doors of our hearts. Because of Christ's death, the angel of death passes over us, and Satan can no longer harm us. So that that is why Christ is glorified in the cross. For there the king is enthroned, and from his pierced side flows the water that is the river of life that sustains us to eternity. So the shadow of the cross still looms over our Pentecost party today, but it's no longer a symbol of death, but a sign of life 
that marks each one of us. For each of you in your baptism has been marked with the cross, marked on the head and on the heart, so that you're claimed by God as his own dear child. And that means your life now revolves around Christ and his cross. If you think that your life revolves around you and what you want or what you feel, then you're worshiping at the wrong altar. You're setting yourself up for a very lonely party of one. But if you see your life centered on Christ and his presence at this altar, then you're on the right track. For here his spirit enkindles the fire of his love. Here we drink with delight from the drafts of his word. Here he fills our hearts to overflowing with his love and forgiveness. And here he knits us into one body and one spirit until that day when we enter that party which will have no end. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Amen.